I would like uh, to structure my talk today uh, around some questions, because I liked very much what Klaus, uh, how he presented his, um, how he had his talk yesterday. Uh, so the science should raise questions, and for example, I will try to give you some answers to those questions that I raise, but hopefully there will be just partial answers which will raise even more questions, because I also very much like the, the um, criteria for a successful conference. Uh, if you leave the conference with more questions than uh, you had when you arrived at the conference, then you might call this conference successful. So that means hopefully I will be able to uh, raise new questions uh, starting from those questions and trying to, to answer them. Okay, we had this question already a couple of times during this conference. So will social media change uh, the, the scientific processes? Uh, and will it influence um, scientific impact? And I guess that's obvious that it's uh, already happening. Uh, so the correct question might uh, uh, have been here actually how this will uh, change, how this social media will change our scientific processes or how it will influence scientific impact. So I will uh, give a very qualitative answer here, so very informal. Um, like Klaus already mentioned yesterday, it's already happening. We are not inventing anything here. So the uh, social media influences this. Um, uh, if you take a look, for example, on how um, current researchers uh, go about their business, so to speak, there are growing numbers of, of us who uh, discuss and share our results, our research literature. On Twitter, Facebook, we use Mendeley to uh, share our uh, research libraries, to uh, manage our uh, references, for example. We review other papers or preprints of these papers on blogs, on Reddit, on very different discussion forums on the web and so on. So that means that our daily research work, uh, which was in previous time uh, mostly invisible, is moving now online, is being put uh, into the spotlight. And traditionally, of course, in this spotlight, uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, somehow assessing and evaluating uh, scientific impact, this spotlight was always almost exclusively on citations. So uh, you might uh, have uh, analyzed, for example, uh, citation counts or citation networks, and it was quite easy by analyzing, by doing so, to quantify the scientific impact. Uh, it was easy in the sense of computation, uh, in the sense of interpretation, of course, there are uh, many problems there, uh, because most of the things that go into these uh, uh, citations are uh, or were invisible in previous times. But of course, today, uh, if all of this moves uh, online, then of course, we will have this data, which is somewhere in these different social media tools, for example, discussion with colleagues, uh, conference talks, small talks, for example, there is like uh, video streaming of this conference, so everything is online now. Uh, and we might try uh, uh, basically to assess how this changes, how this social media influences uh, the impact. So the, uh, the answer to the first question is that, of course, it changed uh, already the way how we do our research work, social media, uh, and it changes, for example, in this qualitative manner. But as a computer scientist, I'm interested in numbers. So I want to quantify somehow this impact. So I want to and in the end of the day to have numbers and to be able to compare these numbers with some other numbers. So the question, the uh, second question is, can we quantify this influence somehow? So now we have this data residing on, uh, online and in different social media tools and how we can quantify. And uh, I will answer this questions, question with three examples. And these three examples will show you that basically there are numerous ways how you can quantify this. Uh, but when you end up with these numbers, there is still work to be done because the question is always what these numbers mean. So what, what did you really measure? Okay, the first example is, let's say, uh, how the uh, uh, social media influences the process, how it pro improves the, the uh, daily work of researchers, so it's not uh, that much on the uh, impact side. Uh, let's say, for example, you have a scientist who needs to access a lot of uh, research articles and uh, the success should be quick and efficient. And the question is how social media can, uh, for example, support this information retrieval, this improve this information retrieval. So traditionally, you will have like a lot of digital libraries. You go there and you have subject catalogs. You can browse them. You can use keyword search. You have, for example, in some more, more advanced uh, systems, you might have uh, faceted navigation and so on. Uh, but that's all but, uh, what's already been available. So for example, you might extract keywords uh, from uh, 
the authors from the papers and, uh, for example, use this to support search. Uh, we had a study with Mendeley where we tried to analyze how taggings, a tagging system that Mendeley has incorporated uh, can help us uh, in supporting uh, scientists doing this information retrieval. Uh, in particular, we were interested, we extracted uh, automatically hierarchies uh, out of, of uh, those tags and were interested in, uh, interested in how these uh, hierarchies can be put to use in navigational structures to help, for example, scientists uh, find relevant literature more easily and more efficiently. Um, you have two diagrams there. So basically, it's, uh, I don't want to, to go into details on these diagrams. The uh, main message here was that we also compare these tag, uh, tags and tagging system with traditional uh, way of um, accessing uh, literature through the keywords that uh, authors uh, insert in the documents. And what we found out, if you extract these hierarchies from the text and if you extract these hierarchies from uh, keywords and put these hierarchies into a user interface to allow users to browse uh, these hierarchies to find their documents, that on average, uh, if you use keyword hierarchies, you need one or two more clicks to reach uh, your uh, target document. And now that's this quant quantification. So now I have a number, on average, one or two clicks more if you use keywords than if you use tagging system. And this shows you, this quantifies somehow uh, how much uh, or how good is the support, uh, for example, of, uh, in that case, social tagging systems in uh, supporting our daily works. Uh, we also uh, formulated a hypothesis why this is the case. Uh, basically, it turns out that the hierarchy which you extract from text, these would be, these one here, are uh, much more rich in structure. So they are um, narrower and deeper. Uh, then the hierarchies which you extract from keywords. These are uh, shallower and broader, have more flat structure, and such structures you might more easily integrate into our user interface. Uh, and that's the reason we believe why uh, the uh, tagging system are were more uh, efficient, more uh, performant in supporting information retrieval. So that means that that's uh, one example how uh, the uh, social media can change our uh, work as a researcher. We uh, also showed that we can quantify this influence. Uh, we end up, uh, ended up with these numbers, and in this case, the interpretation is quite easy. So you, that you can measure it. The numbers that you get are clicks, and you need uh, less clicks with uh, text, for example. Uh, the second example that I want to show you is something that's called citation latency. So that would be the uh, time delay after uh, the paper is published. Uh, uh, before it gets a uh, so-called citation peak, so the, the ma majority of its citations. Uh, and uh, depending on the uh, scientific community, on the uh, uh, publication process, the citation latency is, can be anything between three months to one, two years. Because, of course, once when you publish your paper, then uh, the other uh, people have to read it, then they have to write their own papers, uh, these papers have to go through the peer review process again, and it will take some time. And before uh, the web, before, let's say, social media, uh, depending on, as I mentioned, uh, community practices, it could take up to two years until a paper, even a good paper, gets uh, this citation peak. Uh, the authors, uh, Brody and others, uh, wanted to see what uh, uh, an online plaf platform where you can upload preprints of your pa papers, that was archive, um, which is managed by Cornell University, uh, how this um, platform um, influences this process. What happens with citation latency if the papers are uh, uploaded before they are uh, published? And it turns out, so there, there's a number of curves there. The, the message is actually, the, uh, there are flat curves, uh, which correspond to a higher citation latency, so higher del delay, so it takes more time uh, uh, for the citation peak to uh, take place. Uh, and then uh, these uh, curves correspond to the uh, years when this uh, uh, online system went online. And then in subsequent years, so in uh, recent times, these curves, these distributions move to the left, meaning that the citation latency becomes shorter and they also have now this uh, very steep peak, meaning that this citation peak is even uh, bigger now than it was before. So going from these flat curves, 
with higher high citation latency, now we have the um, situation where we have short uh, citation latency times and very high peaks. And of course, they, the, the, they argued that the reason for this is exactly this platform. So uh, being able to download the papers before they are published allows you to uh, reduce this uh, process of uh, waiting for pre-review and so on. So that uh, would be another example of uh, how, in that case, Web 1.0, for example, influenced the, the way how we published, uh, and uh, another example of quantification of that. So you have now distributions, and you can quantify them. You can end up with numbers how this, uh, this uh, social media or this web uh, usage influenced it, uh, these processes. Uh, the third example is a study uh, done at No Center and Mendeley together. Uh, some of uh, my colleagues were involved with this uh, study. So they extended these uh, downloads for the citations uh, for the third uh, feature of third uh, activity here, and that was readership. Readership in the sense that um, users, Mendeley users, had certain publications in their user library. So that would uh, account for one readership or one read mention, as they called it. And they were interested in, let's say, quantifying how downloads and citations correlate, how downloads and readership correlates, and how citations and readership correlates. Uh, I have three diagrams which uh, show you, so each point here is a paper that they uh, analyzed, um, and at horizontal axis you have the number of downloads, here you have number of sites. And then you can calculate some correlation factor, in this case it was Sperman correlation factor, so rank correlation, uh, which is one if there is like uh, Papers who have high number of downloads have also always high number of citations. If it's close to one, then the tendency goes into this direction. So more downloaded paper gets also more citations. Then uh, the, a similar thing for readership versus citations, where uh, a similar trend can be observed, but this correlation factor is a bit smaller, meaning that uh, it's not uh, as um, much as in the first case. And then downloads versus readerships, where this correlation factor is, again, uh, more than uh, 0.7. Okay, and these results are very in line with several other similar studies uh, that uh, analyze these, like, downloads uh, versus uh, citations or tweet mention, Twitter mentions uh, versus citations and so on. Um, a bit uh, of caution is uh, uh, required here because, of course, these numbers, these correlations that you uh, uh, calculate change um, or they are very unstable, let's say. So if uh, you take another source which gives you the citations, so because you mine the citations basically automatically, you might get a bit different number. So you will always be able to see a similar trend, but the, the absolute numbers will be a bit different. Uh, the numbers also change depending on the journal which you uh, uh, analyze, depending on the conference, depending on the scientific field. So, more or less, the trend is always there, but the numbers may range from, let's say, correlation of 0 0.2, which would be a very, let's say, uh, a weak correlation, to 0 0.7, which will be a strong correlation. Uh, they also notice that uh, these correlations are very uh, time-dependent, meaning that depending on the time window that you use to look at the number of downloads or uh, a number of citations, these numbers will also change. Um, and what they also may, uh, uh, found out here is that there is somewhat smaller correlation between readership and citations. And now you can start basically, you get some numbers, but what, with these numbers what you actually uh, achieved is that you get, um, that you raised many new questions actually. So not, now you might ask questions like, okay, why is this number or this correlation between readership and citations smaller than between, let's say, downloads and citations? Uh, is it, for example, because Mendeley at that time was a very new and young system? and didn't have much uh, readership data at all. Uh, so there was some kind of missing data which, which might uh, come later, you know, later stages. Is it because, for example, user population Mendeley has certain characteristics? Maybe they are in majority PhD students who are young and who uh, actually uh, more uh, read recent uh, studies, recent articles which do not have that many citations. So basically, uh, you see here uh, that um, by just simply quantifying, you are not answering any questions. You get some numbers, but you don't know what to do with these numbers. Um, 
And then you might ask another question. The next question would be, uh, how should we quantify this influence? So you might be, so three examples. The first example uh, was based on some algorithmic approach to extract some hierarchies and then to see how this influence information retrieval. The second approach was, let's say, uh, statistics, basic statistics, so you uh, uh, plotted these distributions of citation latency. The third approach was, again, let's say, non-parametric statistics. You cal uh, calculated these Spearman uh, rank correlations. Uh, and basically, this gives you already a bit of a, a, of a feeling for, for the methodology that we might have here. So depending on the question, you might need to apply uh, another methodology. You will not come uh, uh, far uh, be, with some simple methodological method. So you might uh, want need to apply more sophisticated methods. So some of the problems that I mentioned, uh, for example, in this last study was this time dependence. So depending on the time window, when you counted your downloads and when you counted your citations, you could get completely different numbers. Uh, so for example, if you just counted the downloads in the first six months after the paper was uploaded, and if you counted the downloads in the first two years after the paper was uploaded, and then uh, uh, calculated the um, correlations with the citations, you would get different numbers. So that means you have to take on, uh, into account this time uh, dimension. So it's not just like I will go count there, uh, calculate some uh, correlations and uh, the, the job is done. Then of course these uh, different uh, uh, properties have different dependence on time. Downloads are differently dependent on time than citations or like, uh, uh, Twitter mentions and so on. So social media is very sensitive uh, uh, anyway to time. So it has shorter time spans and so on. So as a uh, fourth example that also uh, discusses this a bit in more details, there was a study by Shuai and others. They uh, looked at downloads, citations, and Twitter mentions. And they applied a bit more sophisticated methodology, which also took into account the time dimension. So not only uh, uh, simple counts, but also how they uh, evolve in time. And what they found out uh, regarding this time dependence, that's a diagram from uh, their paper, uh, so that would be the, um, that's the time, and then that's the distribution of downloads, that's the green um, diagram, and the red one is our three dimensions. Uh, so you see that there is a certain peak of downloads and also of three dimensions. Uh, uh, the peak at downloads comes about four to six weeks after the paper was uploaded. Then you have this very fast decay, uh, but then you have still a substantial activity uh, for the next two years, maybe. Uh, if you take a look at uh, Twitter mentions, then you have Twitter mentions on day zero of upload, of, on day one, and they account for like 80% of all Twitter mentions, and you have 15 or to 18% at day two, and then you have nothing. So it's just like these three days after the upload. So that means now uh, this, uh, uh, brings you to this idea. So if I count downloads only in this period, and for example, tweets only on the first day, then my correlations will be completely different. So I have to take this time into account. Okay, so that means we need a more sophisticated methodology than simple correlations. Uh, it's basically in signal processing, you would apply time series analysis to do this. You might also apply multivariate regression methods and so on. So methodologically, it's a very interesting field. So for computer scientists, for uh, statistic people, uh, you have the data which is very time dependent. You have a lot of data coming from different sources and so on. And that's why we are basically doing it. Um, if you take into account this time and then uh, calculate these correlations, you again get very uh, high uh, positive correlations like that's Twitter mentions versus downloads. So we have correlation of 0.5, uh, man, Twitter mentioned citations of 0 0.4 and download citations of almost 0 0.4. So these results are highly suggestive that there is a strong tie between Twitter mentions, downloads, and citations. So that you may, may now argue, for example, that, or basically let's say there are two explanations for, for this phenomenon. The first explanation would be Twitter, uh, because you, a paper is mentioned that much, that increases the number of downloads, that increases, again, the number of Twitter mentions, that increases, again, a number of downloads, so it's some kind of a positive feedback loop here, 
and in the end, this increases the number of citations. So that's one explanation. The second explanation would be that the paper is actually just good. And because the paper is good, you have high number of tweet, uh, Twitter mentions, you have high number of downloads, you have high number of citations. Of course, these uh, variables can influence each other in, in a positive manner, but at the beginning, there was just a good paper and nothing else. Okay, and then you have to interpret this, and there, there is this problem of causality versus correlation. So if you have, let's say, two variables that are positively correlated or negatively correlated, whatever, um, like these, let's say, Twitter mentions and downloads are positively correlated, then you have different explanations. One explanation is that because Twitter mentions are high, you get higher number of downloads. The other explanation is because you have high number of downloads, you mention this paper a lot on Twitter. Uh, the third explanation could be that the influence is in both directions. You have this positive feedback loop. Or the last explanation would be that there's a third variable like this quality of the paper which influences both. Which basically means that when you get such nice number and since nice correlation, you just raised uh, many new questions. And you just need more analysis and you need interpretation. And now the problem with interpretation, at least for us, for computer scientists, is we cannot do it, actually. So we can have some ideas and we can use it, for example, to, uh, let's say, improve our user interfaces, but we don't know what, in the end, these numbers mean. Yeah? Uh, and that's, of course, uh, the, the reason for this is we lack knowledge in, let's say, user behavior. We need to collaborate with psychologists uh, for this. We need, uh, or we lack knowledge in, let's say, community and social processes. We need to collaborate with social scientists on this. And I'm very happy that a lot of, of uh, these people are here because basically in the end it's, it must be an interdisciplinary approach on uh, interdisciplinary teams that can interpret these results in a satisfactory manner. So a lot of uh, uh, projects across the disciplines are needed to interpret this in a proper way. Okay, and my last question. Now we, uh, I, I showed you that we um, can um, quantify this, we can end up with numbers, that we need to apply uh, sophisticated methods for this. But the real question, at least for me, is can we go, on, go beyond quantification? Can we, under, can we, let's say, create models that will explain what we observe? Can we create models that will be able to predict what will happen in the future? And in the end, if we are able to do so, can we understand what's going on? So that's like the ultimate question here. Uh, so after observing, measuring, quantifying, can we formulate hypotheses which can be tested, which can be refuted, which can be uh, nullified? Uh, can these hypotheses explain the phenomena? Can we predict new phenomena? For example, scientific impact of an article. And uh, to answer this, or uh, basically to raise more questions, I uh, have a fifth example that was a recent, a recent uh, uh, article by Wang and others, Barabasi, for example, that was published last year in Science, uh, where they were interested in the long-term predictability of scientific impact. So is there a long-term predictability in citation patterns? Can you predict anything at all with the citation patterns that we observe? Uh, the question is, are there universal laws which govern this citation process across the fields, authors, journals, whatever? Of course, you will have in, in this model some parameters, which you need to tune for a specific journal, for a specific author, for a specific scientific field. But are all of these uh, fields, all of these authors follow the same universal law? And if you are able to do so, then maybe you will be also able to explain phenomena such as social media, or basically put uh, the influence of the social media in one of the parameters of your, of your model. So it's extremely difficult. Uh, this diagram shows you the uh, citation distributions of different papers. Uh, each curve is a paper and how it gets citations in time. And you will, s so basically what we are asking here for is one equation which can explain all of this. So of course you will have different parameters and when you parameterize this, you will get another curve, but you have to have one single equation for all of them. And it's also extremely difficult because all of these are very heterogeneous uh, um, phenomena. So like um, Michael uh, told us yesterday, you have power laws in the scientific impact, you have power laws in citations, in downloads, in Twitter mentions, everywhere. 
It's very heterogeneous, and you have somehow to explain this heterogeneity. So what, uh, the uh, approach that they applied, they said there are actually just three basic mechanisms which govern this. The first is preferential attachment, or rich get richer, what Michael uh, already mentioned yesterday. So if you have a paper that already has uh, a lot of citations, it will get even more citations. So that's, uh, that you can observe everywhere, not only in citations, but also on the web, in uh, societies, in business. So it's a pretty universal uh, mechanism. Then the second uh, idea was that the novelty of a paper. Uh, and they said, of course, e even if the paper is novel, it will have certain immediacy. So it will get citations at the beginning. And then because the ideas from this novel, no, this novel approach are integrated in other work, it, the, the citations might, de might decay because there is a new work which can be also cited now. So that would be uh, this immediacy which governs the time to citation peak, so the citation latency that we discussed. And then there is something which is called uh, long longevity, which captures this decay rate. So how uh, quick these citations decay in time. And then the third uh, mechanism is something that they call fitness, or let's say the quality, so the intrinsic quality of a paper. And this fitness will, of course, depend on the scientific field, on community, on many different factors. But in the end, this is some kind of a summary of, of all of these different uh, factors. Uh, for example, you might say, let's say, uh, novelty and fitness will depend on the community or, or community response to the work. But they can also capture, for example, this influence of social media. If you have a community which is uh, very uh, often using social media to distribute their work, then, of course, this let's say, fitness of that paper might be also influenced by the way how the uh, people use this uh, social media. Uh, and what they did in the paper is that they provided analytic solution. Uh, they end up with an equation with exactly these three parameters, immediacy, longevity, and fitness. And by setting properly these parameters, you might recover all of the curves for different journals, for different scientific fields, and so on. Uh, what they also uh, did is that they uh, were interested in long-term asymptotic behavior. So what happens after 50 years, let's say. And then they were able basically to uh, cancel uh, the um, influence of immediacy and longevity. And the only uh, parameter which influences uh, this long-term uh, scientific impact, if you uh, like, is fitness. So that would mean that basically only the quality paper in the long run uh, uh, really uh, plays a role. So, of course, in short term, you might get more citations because you tweet a lot about your paper or, for example, because your paper is download, uh, downloaded a lot. But in the long run, after 50 years, after you're long gone, the, only the quality will matter. So that's somehow the, the, the uh, message from this uh, paper. Uh, and then they, of course, uh, did some empirical analysis which confirm those uh, theoretical results. Just as an example, so that would be uh, using their equation and these three parameters, that would be the citation curves. In year two, they look something like this. In year four, so uh, each curve is a different paper. In year 10, year 50, 20, and what you see here is that they converge. So if you go further in time, they will become more or less the same. So that's the, the message. Uh, and basically this curve then in this long time in this asymptotic uh, behavior depends only on the fitness, not on the other parameters. So just to sum this up, uh, of course, social media influences these uh, scientific processes that we, uh, we can quantify this in very, uh, uh, the, the impact or the influence of social media in various ways. Uh, we have to apply sound and sophisticated methodology to uh, perform this quantification. Uh, we need interdisciplinary research to be able to interpret the results, to know what we were measuring in the sense. Uh, and results from this theoretical work uh, indicate that the intrinsic quality of a paper is the only parameter which matters for its long-term impact. But of course, for short-term impact, uh, this can be largely influenced by social media. And with this, I hope that I raise some new questions. Yes, thank you very much, Dennis. Any questions? Yeah. It looks here. very nice uh, as a presentation, not only 
presentation of the work you did, trying to, to see everything from a theoretical point of view, statistically controlled and everything. I have Thank a you. question like that. Uh, there are two problems normally for downloading and citization, especially for downloading. You know, ResearchGate is now useful now in the, our community. Mm -hmm. We're asking you to download your paper, but you are not able to give them to download your papers because it's under the protection of ACM, okay. IEEE, Springer Verlag, and so on. So there are some possibilities to give the... This, hey, you, uh, this so, is very complex situation. No? Yeah. And another one sometimes happens something that it's like a joke. Mm -hmm. The people asking uh, each other to download many, many times, which okay, is yeah, a sure. game, huh? bad yeah. game. So maybe sometimes you have to put some restriction or something like that to see they didn't download, but they asking to download it. Mm -hmm. You know, these are two things that, in my opinion, you have to take into consideration yeah. during your research. So that I. Okay, this it's that is a, a little bit discussion and <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. question because I don't know if you can give any answer about this. Yeah, so the, this study is what were with archive, which is open. Yeah? So it's, uh, you can just upload your preprints. Uh, it's mainly for physics paper or uh, computer science and mathematics. And I know that we upload our papers, although they get published by, by ACM, and we didn't get any complaints about this. So it's just a preprint, yeah? And then, uh, uh, the download numbers are from this, so basically there are no restrictions. You can always download it. Yeah? But of course, with the other um, libraries, you might have these problems. Yeah? So you might uh, then need to take into account, let's say, uh, real downloads and separate them from um, the downloads which were uh, intended but didn't take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so that's uh, this, this archive is all about. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. But for some publishers, you, you are not allowed to do it. Um, I know, for example, that for ACM, you, you have this uh, author link. Author link. So, I triple E, yeah, okay. So, you, you, I can put my ACM papers on my home page if I use this three author. Them, three of them, Springer Verlag, I triple E, and ACM, they, have they do have to sign. Okay, we have another question over there, I think. Did you ask a question? Yes, you. <laughs> Not any other question? Yes, over here. Please. I'm on my way out, but just a very quick one. How, and maybe the answer is very obvious and easy, but how can you assess the long-term effect of publications with social media support and without, if social media hasn't been around, or certainly yeah. hasn't been uh, used to that degree over the last 20 years? Yeah. Uh, well, in this, in not, this, not you, but in the paper, yeah. Yeah, in this number, this fitness, it's a, a summary of all influences, and then basically it's community specific. It's let's say author specific, journal specific. So you might know, uh, have to know, uh, for example, what are the community practices and how community uses social media to ad adjust this in this number. The other way uh, around is uh, to let's say uh, use the data that you already have and learn this parameter. So you can, let's say, mine for the uh, appropriate configuration for each community journal and so on. So that's something that you can also do. But how this number is, in the end, uh, combined out of different influences that you might have, where social media also takes uh, a substantial part, you, don't, you cannot answer this. Yeah. Okay. So okay. that's uh, something that maybe uh, social, social scientists uh, might provide a better answer to you. Yeah? Any other question? Uh, I have a final one. How do you, you, you mentioned that uh, computer scientists then have problems to, to get organized with a community and uh, they have to discuss with the community how to uh, interpret the results. And uh, yeah, yeah. now, as far as I know, uh, even the community, it takes a long time to understand the publishing system, the reviewing system, etc. How do you organize to get this knowledge uh, into, into, into your brain, uh, what, what is, uh, is it workshops or... Yeah, uh, just well, what, what I uh, uh, do in the last couple of years is I go to interdisciplinary conferences like this. 
Uh, there's also a huge conference, uh, Network Science, where you have like mathematician, physici physicist, computer scientists, but also social scientists. And that's, that's something that works for me. Uh, and then, of course, all like joint projects with different uh, other fields. We have also like uh, a strong psychology group in our institute. So you use whatever you can find there. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much again okay. for this fantastic talk. Okay.